she is a licensed professional counselor, a mental health coach, and of course, a real life human being. And I absolutely love that phrase in her bio, but her name is Becca Ferguson, and she's here to talk to us about some of the stuff that she's been through and some of the stuff that's going to help. Becca, welcome to the show. Yes. Thank you so much. I'm so, so, so glad to be here. Absolutely. I'm glad you're here too, because you've been through a lot, girl. Yes, just just a little bit. I mean, like, you know, in the grand scale of things, I'm turning 30 in a couple days. And I'm like, have I really like, you know, they should have a magazine for 30 under 30 for people that have gone through trauma. Like, forget all the business shit. There should be a 30 under 30 for trauma survivors. (laughs) Oh, amen. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) So where are you originally from? Where were you born? Where'd you grow up? So I am from Buffalo, New York, by way of Arkadelphia, Arkansas. So actually born in New York, kind of near the Niagara Falls area, and was raised in Arkadelphia, Arkansas. So I am the only person in my immediate family that has a Southern accent. Oh my goodness. So my father was from upstate New York and my mother was from Arkansas. Oh my gosh. Okay. Everyone has a story about New York and Arkansas. I swear I'm not the only weird one here. So I love that. <laughs> oh, it's hilarious. Yeah. Oh, they, they were kind of an odd couple. Um, oh, well, <laughs> fair. I mean, if you're going to mix Arkansas and New York, then you're probably going to get a lot of weirdos. So, you know, that, that makes sense. So. <laughs> Holy, they ever listened to my podcast, man. <laughs> Hey, you know, I swear if my dad listens to half the shit that I put out there, then he would be like, hmm, what you say? <laughs> oh my gosh. So I know you've been through a lot of stuff. Can you kind of give us some, some cliff notes, some kind of outline of the trauma that you've had to overcome in your life? Yeah, for sure. So, you know, trauma is such a odd term at, when you're a survivor, right? Because I was raised in a very conservative Christian family. It was something that, you know, go to church every Sunday, go to church every Wednesday type kind of thing. And I I didn't feel like there was a problem with that when I was younger. Right. Um, Because it was, it was fine. Like that was the norm. Right. I, Grew up in Arkadelphia, which is a, t- a town of what they say, 10,000 people, but there's two colleges in that town. So <laughs> let's be real here. There is like half that. Um, and in that town, there's like over 30 churches and this small population of people. So if you didn't go to church, you were the odd one out, right? And so growing up in that environment, I didn't know that there was anything wrong with it. I was going to be a preacher. That was kind of my whole goal and everything like that. Um, but, you know, I started to understand as I grew distance from it, like, hmm, I have some mental health stuff that A, my parents aren't aware of because they're not trained in mental health or care about mental health. Um, and then also a a lot of abuse that I went through with my youth minister that I'm just now being able to comfortably say probably within the past year, I was abused by my youth minister. Um, It's a sentence that I notice a lot of victims, you know, as a counselor have a lot of trouble saying I did go through this. Right. And so that's something that just, I say as a human being myself, like, it was hard for me to go through that. It was hard for me to, um, you know, process that as trauma. And then I also had, you know, some nice failed relationships that were probably the example of, um, you know, coming from the abuse that I went through with my youth minister. Like, Oh, Hey, this is how men are supposed to treat me. Hmm, No, 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 it's not. So, um, I've gone through a lot of stuff, a lot of just you know, people treating me like genuine shit and, um, you know, me having to grow on the other end of that. Wow. That's a lot. I mean, it's bad enough that you've, you've already got this stuff going on, but then somebody in that kind of a position takes advantage of you. It, yeah. it was definitely something that I didn't see when it was happening. Right. Because you're supposed to trust people that are in religious authority roles, right? Um, any, any authority roles. Exactly. And, you know, one of the things that came from the, that particular 
mindset was not only do I have to trust him, but I have to trust him blindly because if I don't, then I don't go to heaven. And, you know, obviously that's the ultimate goal. Right. And so, um, yeah, it was, it was a difficult thing to process for sure. And, you know, also being able to publicly say that sentence of the abuse, there's also that fear of like, what is he going to say about it? You know, like, what is his version of the story? Because obviously he doesn't think he's doing anything wrong. Um, so, you know, or people would have said something a lot, a, a lot earlier than what I did. So for right. sure. Right. Did you notice any kind of adapted behaviors because of the abuse you were going through? Not until I got with my husband, actually. I mean, I feel like there was like hints along the way. Um, but the first scenario of, of this, my, my youth minister, it's like, I actually have tried not to diagnose him. <laughs> And that's actually been something like as a mental health professional that I've tried to separate in my own trauma journey. Like I'm trying in my head not to diagnose him because A, I don't want to do that. And B, it's like, that's not fair. Right. But it's like, I could throw a lot of words out there. You need, you see a lot of people that use buzzwords like narcissist or something of that nature. And, you know, he might have some of those qualities, but I choose not to get into his psyche. Right. And so some of the things at first that were like, Hey, something is wrong here was when I first started dating and I started dating when I went to college, I met this guy. He wasn't a horrible human being. Um, I have nothing really against him. He didn't treat me amazingly. Um, but you know, it was that first relationship that I really had, um, when I left home and my youth minister just started acting really weird about it, like telling me that he was using me for sex and that's all I was ever going to be. And, you know, he was treating me like shit and just like, you know, I can't believe that you're going, you're dating someone without thinking about marriage and you only have to date people to think about marriage and, you know, using different words, like, um, derogatory terms to describe a woman that decides to have sex before marriage, um, you know, to explain me and make me feel guilty about that kind of stuff. And that was kind of like the first little flag. But then after the relationship ended, it's like, where was I supposed to go? Like, obviously I have to go back to my youth minister because he has been the consistent person in my life that's raised me um, basically up from being a teenager. And he's the one that taught me everything that I know. And so it's like, there was little red flags, like as I dated people and things that he said, like whenever I graduated college and another relationship had ended, and then it was like, obviously back to him. And then I went into the ministry and he wanted to control a lot of the things that I did. Um, he was nice about it in a way of like, oh, well, when people treat you like this, I get so mad and so defensive. So he was the only person that could protect me. Right. And so like putting that in my head that he was it. But then I met my husband and that was probably like the biggest thing where it's like he was, I think we we're maybe like a couple months into our relationship and he's unloading the dishwasher and I hate the dishwasher apparently like we've decided that's like my biggest flaw is loading the dishwasher in <laughs> in our marriage and um I placed a fork right side up in the dishwasher and so he's unloading the dishwasher and the fork like kind of stabs him in the hand and he just like oh shit you know like three acts because it stabbed him in the hand and like a you know like a typical person would do and react like that and I just started hyperventilating in a corner and I was just really afraid that he was going to hit me or hurt me or say really bad things. And he was like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> and I was just like, all right, didn't I do something wrong? And he was like, dude, like, yeah, I mean, you put the fork in there upside down, but I'm fine. And so it's like, okay, when I do something wrong, I'm not supposed to get beat. Like that didn't make sense to me. Right. And so, um, I started unraveling that. And at that point when we were dating, 
I was still driving between Arkadelphia and Northwest Arkansas. And so I was still going to church. I was still like involved with my youth minister and, you know, interactive in that environment. And so then I started to see like, hmm, I don't think that how he's treating me is right. Like, I think that is abusive, you know, trying to unpack that, it, all of this. Cause he, like I was in graduate school at that point in time to become a counselor. He did not like that because he didn't know anything about counseling. And so like he wanted complete control with that. And so that was something that was really, really difficult for him to unpack. And um, so when he didn't have control, either my relationships or job or something like that, like he didn't, he, he, he would lash out about it. And so it was like a couple, like I think a year into dating my husband, when I started talking to someone, another church member, and I said, I think that, you know, he is abusive towards me and I just don't know what to do about it. And it actually played into my youth minister's hands like really well, because I talked to this lady about it and she was like, oh my gosh, we don't like him. He is a horrible guy. Yes, we have to get him fired. Um, the Me Too movement was very, very popular at the time. So she was like, you should say that he sexually assaulted. Me. And I was like, no, because that never happened. Yeah, you know, not it was, right. you can't be making up sexual assault allegations. Correct. And so I was like, I got mad at her. And then in turn, told my youth minister. And my youth minister was like, if they're saying all this stuff about you, then you have to leave. And so he had me write a letter to the church saying this never happened between us. And I am now leaving the church and then had me turn in my keys and say, I'm done. And I ended up having a conversation with him. He said he never, never thought that he abused me. He always treated me like a daughter. He loved me if it was in you know, if it was in my best interest for him to leave my life, then he would do that. And I thought at that point in time, still being in his trap, that that was really sweet and caring and loving and kind. And it so I remember- It sounds really sweet. I mean, this exactly. is, these are all the words that you're craving and needing and wanting to hear. He's exactly. giving you what you're needing. And so I, I called my husband after that, who- my husband has always kept his mouth shut when it comes to me determining who to have relationships with. He keeps his mouth shut and he gives me that ability to have my autonomy, which is what I love about him. And so I called my husband and I said, you know, I talked it over with him. He said, he's really sorry. He said, he's always loved me. And my husband just was like, dude, he is lying to you. He is an abusive piece of shit. I cannot handle this anymore pack your bags. You're moving up here. You're done. And I was just like, I had never heard my husband talk like that before ever. Like, but he was just like, you're done, like completely done with this. And I was just like, okay. And <laughs> so I packed my bags and I moved up here. I moved in with him and I really haven't turned back. I've gone back to church one time. Um, my youth minister did end up getting fired like two years later off of something that was completely unrelated. Um, he like a old man fell on his ass and he was responsible for it. So it was just like, you know, something out of the blue. Right. Lame. Um, yeah, I know. I was like, Oh, he can beat a teenage girl for 10 years and not get fired, but an old man falls on his ass and we got to protect the old man. Like that's what we got to do. <laughs> right. Um, and so it, it was one of those things where it's like, I did go back to church afterwards, but it was just so triggering. I was just like, ah, I'm, I'm in this environment where I feel judged and I can't do this. And, and so I, I've been completely separ separated myself from that environment and it's been very healing for me in the process. But yeah, that's just a little bit of how things develop. Wow. As much as we all hate commercials, they are a necessary evil these days. This is what keeps the show on the air. You can show your support by purchasing one of my many books or donating through PayPal or leaving a review on whatever platform you listen to this podcast on. You can find the links for the books or donation options in the podcast description. 
As always, a portion of the proceeds do go to local organizations that help fight human trafficking. And now, back to my guest. I know that you had said to me at one point um, in our little questionnaire thingy uh, that you didn't know that you had PTSD until you were already a therapist. What was that discovery like? Dude, that was rough. I mean, and when I say rough, like that was probably one of the most difficult things. It was kind of funny. Um, And I feel like you have to have like a little bit of a morbid sense of humor sometimes to be a therapist (laughs) Um, or work. (laughs) Yes. I mean, and Cause it's like you hear really rough stuff all day long. So sometimes you like to dissociate it from it. You kind of, kind of have to be a little twisted. And so, um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm talking with my therapist and she said, she says out of the blue, well, we know you have PTSD. And I was like, who is we? I was like, what are you talking about? She was like, this is all PTSD. And I was like, that's some bullshit, dude. I was like, I no, I don't like, you're not like, if you have PTSD, you're a victim. Like I'm not a victim and I'm not allowed to be a victim. Like being a victim is something that's wrong. And so she was just trying to help me unravel this. And, and I was like, okay, trying to wrap my head around it. And I call my supervisor that I had when I was an associate counselor, cause I was dealing with something with a client that I had to work through. And so I called my, my old supervisor and I was like, yeah, you know, I'm doing okay. I was like, kind of just started to wrap my head around this idea that I have PTSD and my old supervisor just being the like, you know, person that she is, she was like, you know, abused by their youth minister for 10 years and has all the vicarious trauma that she deals with, with her clients on a daily basis has PTSD. That's insane. And I was like, oh my God, shut up. Why is everyone just being like this? And so, yeah, I mean, like it was a weird discovery and growing up, I wasn't allowed to be a victim. I wasn't allowed to have that victim mindset um, per se. And so it was like, it's been difficult to wrap my head around that. I feel like it's probably just been within the past year or two that I've been able to say, like, I have PTSD, I am a victim. Um, but I also am a survivor. And so it's like trying to balance all that kind of stuff out. It's been, it's, it's difficult to, to work on for sure. Oh yeah, absolutely. A lot of people are scared of the word victim too. Dude, it's, it's a scary word. It is. It's a very scary word. And in growing up in the very conservative environment that I was growing in, growing up in, it's like, you know, I love my father and <laughs> we have an interesting relationship for sure. But my dad is one of those people that will never take a handout. At least yeah. that's what, you know, he says. And so like at one point in time, he's almost 65. So he's almost eligible for Medicare and retirement and all this kind of stuff, blah, blah, blah. And, um, I said, dad, you hate your job right now. Just go ahead and quit, you know, like go ahead and quit, like get benefits. Like you can do that. And he was like, I have never taken anything from the government. I will not be a victim. I will not do that. And it's like, that's the mindset that I was raised in. Whenever you take some help from someone else, like you are a victim and you you have to be self-sustaining. You have to be able to help yourself. But the question is like, how in the world can you help yourself when, you know, you're, you don't have the knowledge or tools to be able to do it because you're still stuck in the mind frame that you were raised in. And so it's like this idea that you have to evolve as you grow. And some of that may mean Like you were a victim of someone doing something. You could be walking through Walmart and someone, you know, take an apple out of your cart that you put in it because they don't want to walk all the way to the apple display to go buy apples. And you are a victim of someone taking an apple out of your cart. That is a thing. But people want to reserve that word victim for really, really big traumas. And so it makes people that have gone through traumas like me, where it's like, yes, I understand the abuse that I went through was extensive. I told myself for years that it wasn't a big deal. 
I told myself like, well, I laughed when he hit me and I, I chose a relationship with him and I chose to go to church and I chose to go back and listen to his advice. So there's no way that I can be a victim because I chose it. It you're groomed, you know, you're, you're a child or you are raised on certain ideals and beliefs. If I wasn't raised as a conservative Christian, then that would have been easier for me to say that I'm a victim, right? Um, but because I have, I was raised with ideals and beliefs that you have to trust all of religious authority members, right? Then it's hard for me to separate that. And, and it can be really, really complicated, man, to, to work through that. So yeah, I mean, victim is a scary, scary word. Yeah. What was the biggest help that you found to be able to recover from everything that you've been through? Oh, um, goodness gracious. I, I've got to say that I'm, I'm still there, you know, I'm still trying to find resources that help. I still have, um, I still have flashbacks. I still have a lot of unknowns. Um, my husband has been probably my biggest supporter in this and been so helpful in my healing journey. Um, I, on top of having PTSD, I also have OCPD um, and I'm kind of starting to think I might have just a little bit of ADHD, <laughs> just a little bit. Um, and so, you know, and obviously anxiety and depression comes with the PTSD. And so I, in my head, I have to have everything organized and I have to have a plan. And so the OCPD kind of works against me sometimes in my healing where it's like, I can't heal unless I see the end of the tunnel. Mm -hmm. Right. And so it's like, I, I remember a couple of months ago, I was sitting on my therapist's couch and I'm like, dude, I'm just so tired of the flashbacks. I and I've told my husband this since multiple times. I wish I was still naive. Like, I wish that I was still naive to the fact that my youth minister abused me. I wish that I would have never put two and two together. Um, just for the simple fact that I it, sometimes knowing that it was wrong is more painful than still being in it. At least that's how it makes sense in my brain. And so my therapist gave me this self-compassion workbook that I honestly, it's been a game changer for me. And, um, it's the mindful self-compassion workbook by Kristen Neff and Christopher Shermer. And, um, these people that, that wrote this book, it's just so laid out for you and what you need to do to be kinder to yourself, um, and how you can give yourself the respect that you deserve, the compassion that you deserve and know that I don't have to go a million miles an hour because I still live in a very survivalist mindset um, where it's like, okay, I, my um, the, one of the things that my our couples therapist said to us the last time, because um, my husband is trying to figure out more ways that he can help me, right? And so in going to couples therapy, we're trying to figure out like, what is our communication barrier? Why, why are we not understanding each other? And, um, you know, therapists just very easily says, well, Becca, you were raised with conditional love. Well, he was raised with unconditional love. So it's really hard for him to understand how people can't love you. Right. And I was like, eek. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, so this self-compassion journey that I've gone down has been very helpful for me to be able to say, like, just because I do something wrong doesn't mean that people are going to hate me and that I have to earn their respect again. Like, I need to work on earning my own respect first and not going down this journey of just absolute miserableness, right? Um, every single time I feel like I do something wrong. And so just being more compassionate with myself has been very, very helpful. That's amazing. It's not an easy thing to find really. Yeah. But no, 
It is. And it's, it's difficult because when you've been conditioned by someone to hate yourself for literally every single thing that you do, um, it, man, it, it can be so difficult to process that and move forward from that. So yeah, I, I, it, it definitely does take some time, but it's worth it. Yeah. I've been there myself. It's exactly the way I grew up too. Yes. And no one wants to admit that because then you have to put responsibility on other people besides yourself for doing something wrong. Right. And, and we were taught to take ownership of everything. Exactly. <laughs> and so it's like, it, you know, I, I get so frustrated and, um, sometimes cause it's like, I love my parents. They're great people, but there were a lot of things that they needed to know that they don't, that they know now, you know, um, I didn't know mental health existed until I went to college. I didn't know anxiety existed until I went to college. And I understand that you have a blog that you've been working on for a while. Have you got a piece of that that you would like to read for us? Yeah. So, um, I do, I have this one blog that I, that I wrote, um, I was supposed to be a preacher. And so, uh, I want you to kind of go on this little journey with me. I like to be able to story tell. So deep breath in. Okay. Imagine this. I'm in third grade sitting at the lunch table with my friends. We start talking about what we want to do when we grow up without hesitation. I say, I'm going to have to go to college for 10 years after I graduate high school, because I'm going to go to seminary to become an ordained Methodist preacher. What third grader says this shit? Me. Hi, I'm the problem. It's me. From a young age, I knew that I wanted to be in ministry. As you've read from my previous post, you know that my story involves a lot of history in the Methodist church. I was raised in a very conservative Christian home and church was what we did. When I graduated from high school, I looked for schools where we could start my journey as a preacher. I knew that with my learning style, I would need to find a small school where I could feel comfortable asking questions. It was important to me to have a tight knit community. I toured the religion department and didn't find a huge connection there, but I knew I wanted to become a minister. I wanted to be relatable and viewed as a person with open arms. Wow. Third so if you, grade. Yes. It, literally. I can honestly, I can remember that. That's a deep cut memory. I think that was also the same day that I spilled milk on my cargo pants. So it's a sad, sad day all along. Um, but yeah, from third grade, I knew that's what I wanted to do. And now looking back, it's like, I've told people if there is a God that's out there and you know, I'm, going with that ideal. Cause obviously there's a lot of guilt that's still associated with understanding my own faith. I think, you know, I, I really feel like this is the journey that I was supposed to go on and this is how I was supposed to be the person with open arms. So, yeah. Well, um, I am going to make sure that I include all of your links and stuff so people can read more about you. They can find out more through your Facebook, your Instagram, your TikTok, which is a lot of fun, uh, and your website. Yes, I've been stalking you on TikTok. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It is that time where I ask you the final question, and it's always my favorite question of every episode. Yeah. What is one thing that you truly love about yourself that's not related to your physical appearance? You know if I could say one thing that I really love about myself, it's the fact that I do know how to love people. Um, and I know how to love people safely. If you've enjoyed tonight's episode, please make sure you check out the episode description. You'll find links there on how you can learn more about this guest links to connect with social them. media and how to support the podcast. Remember, I don't get paid to do this. My boss is a bit tight fisted, but I can say that. I work for myself.